How you doing? This is John, and welcome to John's Long Box. Today, we're checking out a, a pretty obscure comic. This is Marvel Feature Presents The Astonishing Ant-Man. This is number eight, 20 cents. And this is a remarkably good condition. They're pulled by the... Uh, I, I don't remember where, when I got this. I forget if I bought it in a collection or if I... I, I definitely didn't buy this off the shelf. This is in too good condition. <coughs> Again, I don't cough all day long until I turn on this camera. This is the most heralded, one of the most heralded Ant-Man spectaculars of all, the astonishing origin of the world. So that's why I wanted to do this. I don't have the uh, the original tales to astonish with the origin of, of Hank Pym as Ant-Man and the origin of uh, Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp. So this is this is the best I'm going to do. Those comics are kind of out of my price range right now, unless I find a collection or whatever. So uh, I thought... I, I, li I like to bring people up to speed about the origin of of heroes that they're familiar with from the uh, from the movies or whatever. I, I'm I, uh, I'm not going to assume that people are crazy lunatic comic book collectors like myself, and I can't, you know, I'm not going to be snooty and be like, well, you should know because not everybody is born at the same time. If you were born, you know, two thousand, say you don't have access to, to these old, old comics. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, consider this public service. That's that's what I am. I'm just a helpful guy. So look at this cover. Okay, so what does Marvel feature? So let, let's let's start at the beginning. Marvel feature is one of uh, three comics that Stan Lee created. Um, for those who may or may not know, Marvel had a, a problem with the distributors and, and their their production line was was limited for a long time they had split comics so one of them they had tales of suspense tales to astonish and uh strange tales and those were they started out as as you know anthology horror science fiction comics like most comics in, in the 50s and early 60s and then later on they were split at like t uh, strange tales had uh had the human torch on one side and you know, for the first half, and then the second half, it, it had Doctor Strange. Then the Human Torch left, and it became Nick Fury and Doctor Strange. Tales to Astonish had Ant-Man and I think uh, the Submariner, no, the Hulk. And then later, Ant-Man left, and it became the Submariner and the Hulk. And then uh, Tales of Suspense was Iron Man and Captain America. And because they had, I, I don't know the exact details why, but the, 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 there's they, they were limited in how many comics they could put out every 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 month. Well, when that distribution deal was over, they were free to, to take the, the, the split comics and give everybody their own. So Captain America took the numbering and the first issue of Captain America became Captain America 100. I know that's confusing. And then Iron Man became Iron Man number one. The Submariner came, became number one and the Hulk started at 100. Um... And Nick Fury got a number one, and Doctor Strange, I think, started it at, at uh, 198 or something like that. And boom, you know, Marvel's made a whole bunch of new single character comics. One of the things that they did do, I think it was 72. We'll, we'll, I often make mistakes, and we'll check the indicia on the inside. I like to just go with my uh, memory and then see if I'm correct or not. Uh, is Stan Lee said, we're going to make three more anthology comics to debut stuff. So it's kind of like a, the shotgun approach. We're just going to scatter some stuff and see, see what hits the mark. So one of them was Marvel Feature. The Marvel Feature had Ant-Man. It also had The Defenders. The Defenders debuted in this comic. Ant-Man, well, Ant-Man was already a hero, but he's going back into this comic. And then later on, it was, uh, uh, geez, I, I can't even think, but uh, it had like Marvel 2 and all the thing guest starring. And that's really the only, well, The Defenders was a success. And then the uh, Marvel 2 and 1, the Thing team up book, came out of this. So I, this was canceled in issue 12. They also had Marvel Spotlight. Marvel Spotlight had Werewolf by Night. It had Moon Knight. Um, it had Spider Woman. And it had uh, Ghost Rider. So that was a big, big, big hit. And um, for the life of me, I can't remember the, the third one. It was, oh, and Marvel Premiere. Marvel Premiere didn't really. Uh, do that well out of the three. I think Marvel Premiere was the least successful. Although this got canceled, 12. Marvel Spotlight went on for a few issues. That also, uh, I, I I forget the number, so I'm just going to stop. So here we have Marvel Feature presenting the Astonishing Ant-Man. And the premise of these Ant-Man stories is Hank, doing some tinkering, trapped himself at six inches tall. So I think they were uh, kind of 
copy and the success of, of the power of the atom. The, in DC, the atom was trapped and he went into some like barbaric savage kingdom and he was using like a needle as a sword, stuff like that. So it was like a mix between sword sorcery and sci-fi with, with uh, Ray Palmer, the atom. And of course, comic books always copying each other. They, they kind of ripped it off a little bit. So Hank Pym is trapped at six feet tall and they didn't say it, but they must, the, the chemistry must have altered his powers because he doesn't have the strength. He can't control the insects and he doesn't have his, so it, the whole premise is he's trapped at six inches tall and, he, and he's dealing with the world, not as a superhero, kind of as a, as a, a guy trapped. And then the wasp, she, uh, for a display of whatever, drinks the same chemicals and now she's trapped, although she retains her wings, but she doesn't have her blast, she doesn't have her strength and she can't talk to ants, you know, her intent. So it's just a, I thought it was a silly premise and I pretty much don't like it. Um, and as you could tell, neither did most people because it was quickly forgotten about and it only lasted a couple issues. So here we have the splash page, prelude to disaster. A side effect, he, he he's trying to work on an antidote and she, of course, just chugs it. She just chugged the antidote, you know. And he lets her chug the antidote. And, of course, she mutates into, like, a wasp creature. So she grows this stinger out of her butt. And her mind is more insect-like. So she doesn't, re you know, she's she's not intelligent. She's savage. She's a beast. I, I do like the uh, the artwork of, of the plants and everything like that. And, you know, he's, he's just got this turtleneck sweater and pants and definitely ripping off Gil Kane's uh, Sword of the Atom. So here we have the story by Mike Friedrich, who uh, is a great writer. He he created the uh, Ghost Rider, both incarnations, the Cowboy Ghost Rider and the Johnny Blaze Motorcycle Ghost Rider. Art by Craig Russell and Jim Starlin. Oh, uh, okay. Inks by Jimmy Jeans, who I know nothing about editing, Roy Thomas. And uh, this comic suffered from the... Uh, dreaded deadline doom it, it, meaning that they they had to publish something because it was on a newsstand and they had contracts to fulfill like in the direct market when it goes to comic book stores they were a little bit more lenient with with uh times tables but back then you had subscriptions you had, you had uh other companies that were filling comp magazine racks you had you had to put out the comic by hook or by crook so i don't know you know, the, the artist, Craig Russell, Jim Starr. So I don't know who, if it was the art that, this, that that delayed it or if it was the writing that delayed it. I don't know. I wasn't there. So what they did was they had a couple of pages and then they took the origin of the Wasp by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee and inserted this so they could have a comic book come out. You'll see. So this is just a framing sequence. Um, and that's what they did. They some I, I know that later DC, I don't know about Marvel, but if you got hired and you were doing a 12-issue run of a comic like if you know back then they had uh writers who were semi who were permanent on, on a comic until either they left or sales slumped like like uh, chuck dixon did detective comics for god knows how many years chris claremont did the uh, x-men for like 20 years and uh, peter david did the, the hulk for like 11 years but they would write 13 issues a year instead of 12 and that that 13th issue would have to be a standalone issue. It would be drawn and colored and then put into a shelf someplace. And that would be called an inventory, an inventory issue. And the inventory issues would uh, be taken out if, if for some reason the comic wasn't going to come out, if there was some sort of unseen disaster. I, I, I think it was, a, I forget who it was, but somebody, I think it was Eric Larson had a fire in his house when he was doing Spider-Man. And uh, he couldn't he couldn't do like two months of comics. He had to, you know, you can understand the guy had to deal with with a lot. So somebody else they took over the comic for, for those two issues. That's what inventories they're just like insert here cook to keep keep this, the publishing schedule properly. They don't pretty much do inventory issues anymore. At least I don't think they do because, uh, you know, with the direct market, they're a little bit lenient. Uh, Chuck Dixon famously said that there's untold, fully drawn. Chuck Dixon, Jim Apparel, Batmans that have never seen the light of day. Wouldn't that just be a wonderful series? Just DC put out all of those inventory issues that are that are too dated to fit into current continuity. That would be, oh my God, you know, untold tales. And they do do that every once in a while. I know uh, DC put out the uh, the canceled comics cavalcade, which was like a six issue run of, of, of issues of comics that ne that ne never came out in their regular run. But again, I'm talking for nine minutes. And I didn't even talk about this comic yet. So. Uh, did I go at the end this year? What year is this? 1972. Okay. 
1972. I thought I saw it in 1972. Yep. Oh, this, okay, the copyright is 72, and this is 1973. So, so here's the wasp. She's coming at Hank Pym. So they, they, they fought some stupid robot last issue, and uh, they, they acted like amateurs because plot-wise. I mean, I understand it's supposed to be they have no power. So they don't even, like, when Ant-Man shrinks down to ant size, he's supposed to retain full human strength. So he's supposed to be, like, you know, he could lift a nail, he could smash through glass jars and stuff like that. But he was trapped by a glass jar and whatever, all last issue. So they didn't say it, but in order to buy this premise... He's trapped at six inches tall, and he must have, or, or ant size, I, I don't know if it's six inches tall, but he must lose all of his benefits of shrinking, otherwise the story doesn't make any sense. So he's being chased by Janet Van Dyne, he falls down, hits his head, and insert the Jack Kirby, Stan Lee issues. So this is all a framing sequence, for, this is all a reprint from uh, Tales to Astonish 44, which is the first appearance of the Wasp. So, and that's why I'm talking about this, because I don't have that particular issue. So here he is just sitting out in his chair and this, he's daydreaming about his, his late wife. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, but he but he was married to Maria, okay? Uh, uh, Maria Pym and her, her maiden name was uh, Maria Troivaya from, uh, from Hungary, which at the time was behind the Iron Curtain. You know, this was, you know, he, I think he debuted in, in 64, so... The marriage was even before 64. So now this is a flashback within a flashback. Here he is flying behind the, the, the red curtain. And she's abducted by uh, Soviet agents. They they just hit Henry Penn, but they take her. Uh, apparently her family is an important family from uh, behind the Iron Curtain. And he's like, stupidly, they're like, hey, nobody's going to bother you. You, you. You're not Maria Troyova anymore. You're Troyava anymore. You're, you're Maria Pym. So blah, blah, blah. Of course, they, they know and they tell her there was a note found on her body that she was a that this is what happens when you attempt to flee the iron curtain she's dead it can't be not my wonderful wife now at that point i'd like to point out that there's a new character called the wasp in current marvel and the and she is the daughter of his first wife and i i don't know if she was pregnant with a Henry Pym, so I don't know if that's really Henry Pym's daughter, or 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 she he didn't know about her before the marriage. I I I I don't know the details, but uh, I think they kind of hinted that that she was captured and you know because they they never show the body or anything like that, so it's totally within comic book mores and and tropes to to that she's still alive. You know, if they were to bring her back, it, to me it would. That's cool. We didn't see a mutilated body, you know, and that's one thing in comic books. If you don't see the body. Then they're not dead, and even then, they they may not be dead. So who knows? I I don't know the origins of the, uh, of the uh, new wasp that I don't think succeeded, and they're going back to Janet Van Dyne. And that's another thing Marvel does: they try out other characters and go back. DC does it too. So, uh, so now he's goes back to work, and just he's just concentrating on being Ant Man. No, 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 I, I, I'm jumping ahead. So he's all pissed off. So in this panel, a lot happens in this panel, is he just goes nuts throughout Hungary trying to find out who killed his wife, and now he's in jail. They, they just say it in the text. The young scientist went berserk and within a few days landed in jail. So he just went around going nuts. And I think that's in character, even, even though it might be accidental, because they, they kind of bring up that Henry Pym has, like, emotional instability and maybe some mental issues later on. And uh, it, looking back at this early stuff, it's, it, it's cool to see how it all fits in. And I, I, I don't think it was planned. That's one of the things I always say about comic books. It's, it's, it's Legos. You put down one Lego, then another writer snaps another Lego on, maybe a different color. And, but you have one big sculpture, you know, built upon the next. And, and nobody thinks of the second Lego when they put down the first Lego. You know, at, at least they didn't. Maybe they do. Maybe some writers do, but not all the time. So now he's pissed off. He goes back to America, and he's thinking, "I, I, I gotta do this. Who killed Maria? I got, I gotta get closier. I gotta bring these people to justice." But you know, they're gonna be watching Henry Pym, but they're not gonna be watching Ant Man. So he takes, you know, and, and uh, Maria kept saying that the ant is a hard worker. They, what, what is, what is the exact thing she says? Oh. Go to the ants, thou sluggard.
it, so that was one of the things that Maria used to say to him, meaning work hard. So he took it, all right, I'm going to go to the ants, and he becomes Ant-Man. And now he's going to go and uh, avenge her, her death. So now he's, it's in the present, in the flashback. <laughs> I know that's confusing. And he's thinking, I could use a sidekick. You know, there's so much avenging and hero play that needs to be done. I could use a sidekick. And as fate have it, because coincidences are a big deal in comic book, here comes Dr. Van Dyne with his lovely daughter, Janet. And she looks somewhat like Maria. She looks somewhat like Maria, and she's much younger, not more than a child. It's creepy there. Um, he's quite handsome, but scientists are such bores. I prefer adventurous types, not those dull intellectual bookworms. Dun, dun, dun. So a little bit of a conflict there. And he's trying to do gamma ray research, Ms. Dr. Van Dyne, to contact other species of life. And he's just like, well, that's that sounds really cool, but I'm doing cellular research and shrinking and blah, 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 blah. So they compare a little bit of notes and they leave. But that's all that matters is that Janet got to meet Hank. So he goes back to work, back to work, did I skip the page, no I did not, so that's Dr. Van Dyne, and he's trying to contact another galaxy, and she's like, I'm going out partying, you know, think of her as like Paris Hilton, and, or, or Kim Kardashian, I guess these days, Paris Hilton's even a dated reference now, right, and the gamma rays push him back, and this horrific, creature comes from the planet cosmos the planet cosmos deep in space we have cosmos or a fluid form of life i escaped down the path of your ray onto your planet so he turned the gamma ray into a, a transport beam and, and oozed he's this like gelatinous fluid like creature and uh, look into my eyes look into my eyes and he has like a death glare so he's not dead and um, he's made out of Basically, his body's made of, like, acidic gelatin. So she's seeing the, you know, they're not showing the gore, but the body's just being ripped apart and decayed by the acid, and she smells it. Oh, my God, no, oh, my God, no. So who could I tell? Not the police, not the FBI, not the Fantastic Four, because, well, the Avengers didn't exist in this flashback, but Hank Pym. So she calls Hank Pym, and he says, okay. And he does his Ant-Man stuff. And here we have the adventures of Corgi Boy. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> and this I always found, even as a kid, I found this unrealistic. He has this gun and he fires it. And he goes all the way across town and lands at Janet Van Dan's house. Just say so you can fly. I mean, wind resistance, stuff like that. How far how far would an ant sized guy go? You know? You can't just shoot across the city in that, but whatever. So the ants catch him. They open up the window. And you see this? Arm? This helmet has all these cybernetics so he can give commands to ant. This part is a, is a megaphone because he's so tiny people can't hear him. So he talks and that amplifies the voice so she can hear him, which is kind of clever. So she's talking, Ant-Man, I'll, I'll take care of this. And he's doing tests and chemicals and stuff like that. And he says, call the FBI ask for Lee Kearns. And Lee Kearns was a recurring character that kind of got forgotten about. And I thought it was kind of cool because he made friends with this FBI agent, Lee Kearns, and he would drop tips to Lee Kearns. And then Lee Kearns would uh, clean up all the stuff. He would leave the scene of the crime and then the FBI co would come and arrest everybody. It, it's something that's kind of forgotten about that. Like back in the early days, superheroes and law enforcement kind of kind of worked hand in hand, you know. Uh, but uh, at the same time, Nobody knew who Ant-Man was, and he would disappear and leave. So it's not like the FBI could... Uh, well, I'm sure they were investigating, but you'll see he does something later on in the story. So now he's going back to do some investigating, because he is a scientist first and foremost. And he finds out that the ants are afraid of the creature from Cosmos. So that's, that's a big clue. So he's investigating. He's growing up tall. And uh, he calls Janet Van Dyne. She comes over. And he's like, I see a fire in you. I see whatever you want to know, justice, blah, 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 blah. Ta-da, he takes off his, his robe and he's got an Ant-Man costume. He says, you want a partner? He's like, yeah, I'm going to do some unlicensed, untested experiments on you. Is that cool? And she's like, yeah, of course that's cool because, you know, whatever. So he's showing her, I, I made these artificial cells. They kind of changed this in retrospect, but, the you know, these are artificial wasp cells. So in her forehead, I'm 
pointing to my forehead like you can see it it in and in her back these cells are there so she always has tiny little wasp wings and she has tiny little antennas that probably look like hairs but when she shrinks down they say the same size and now she has antenna and 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 wasp wings pretty cool so he puts this mask on her because you know you just met the guy getting some bondage gear but that's their relationship and now there's an earthquake and what's going on the creature from cosmos is growing he's absorbing nutrients through his body like a gelatinous slob and you're like oh we got to do something so he just happens to have an unstable molecule costume that fits her because because that's what he does and he's investigating and he sees he's coming towards the George Washington Bridge and he's going to knock over. The George Washington Bridge, for those of you who don't know, connects Upper Manhattan to New Jersey. So we're going to, there's going to be uh, some, some problems there. So shrinking gas and they, she shrinks. No training, nothing. She shrink and there's the wasp wings. So remember, these wasp wings are always present on her back, tiny. So if she was to wear like a, a, a backless gown or something, and if you look closely, you would see tiny little ant-sized wings on somewhere on her back and and little antenna that they, they, they never see well these antenna i guess and now she could flies and he's using that uh ejector to to, to uh to, but remember she's superhuman strength she's fully woman strength and he only weighs like an ounce so she should be able to carry him you know but it looks like they're flying so get it straight either he could fly or he can't so the ants form a cushion they land on and they're watching the army fight him and the army he's gelatinous the missiles just get absorbed by him and he becomes bigger and bigger so like don't look at him he has a death glare i don't they never explained how he knew that but she goes rushing off to to fight him and he's like that's why you know I'm, we're scientists we got to do this scientifically we, you know if bullets aren't going to stop him what are you going to do she doesn't have the wasp blasts yes that, that's something that comes later power creep always happens superheroes always get more powerful so they're flying ants and he's doing tests on some samples and he finds that you know he's formic acid and he's using these compounds that they use to repel insects and dissolve formic acid and what do they do they put it in shotgun shells and rather than stay human sized and just blast the thing with a shotgun he has a bunch of ants and i love that there's rifling in it when when it's shotguns because uh i guess new york compo creators don't understand guns <laughs> You, you don't need rifling in shotguns <laughs> rifling is is grooves in the barrel so that when the lead comes it puts a spin on it and, and spins to make it more accurate shotguns just blast beads out pop, 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 pop. you don't need rifling that's why it's called a rifle and a shotgun they're two different things but what, what, what uh, you know people don't know guns so here's look at this guy he looks at the stay puff marshmallow man he's terrorizing manhattan and the ants are carrying the shotgun because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to just be a big guy walking down the street with a shotgun carrying everything. You got to stick to your motif, even if it's silly. And he's pulling this, the trigger and the ants are absorbing. So just think about how many ants are getting killed from the recoil of, of this shotgun, you know. But I guess Ant-Man never really cared about his, the ants. So he's pulling the trigger again, pulling the trigger and it breaks down his cohesion and he just dissolves into a puddle of goo and they succeeded and she goes to kiss him and he was like we better get back to the lab that was like a thing for a while are they are aren't they you're too young i'm i'm, you, I'm still hurt for maria and she's like he's blushing he's pretending that is so she pursues even harder and now he's talking to lee kearns and once again normal size hen pen puts in the call to the fbi in a telephone with a scrambler so that the call cannot be traced so that's the magic science device put on the, the telephone so he can so the fbi is trying to investigate him but uh, he is super smart and will not and not fall for that so now the framing sequence so they only did like two pages and the rest they used from uh from jack kirby and stan lee and now we're back he's talking about to all my iterations first i was ant-man then i was giant man then i changed my name to goliath then i was yellow jacket now i'm back to ant-man and i fought the power man which is a terrible name terrible robot egghead some some really bad villains he has a bad rogues gallery and here he is now and he goes jan has always been by my side oh the pathos oh the agony what can i do now that she's got a what is that called an abdomen thorax I, I i don't know the insects parts but there's the thorax uh, i don't know and there we go 
my wife might kill her. So if he stings her, she's gonna die. Conclusion. Now we have the, the letters page, whose names, I, I don't know anybody's names. I just like checking out the names, but also keep in mind, this is 1972. And we have women, you know, women of Shirley, two, two letters by women. Women have always been into comic books. You know, majority have been men, but women have always been into comic books, always writing comics. And that last issue, I, it had a letter from a woman who grows up to become a writer and editor at Marvel. So there you go. That's, that's comic books. This 1972, women have always been writing letters, collecting comics. So I always find it funny in the modern age. We're like, well, we got to change things to get women interested. Women were always interested. You know, there you go. Grant over. So there you go. This is Marvel Features presents the Astonishing Ant-Man, a pretty forgettable series. I only broke this out because I, I thought it would be important to talk about the origins of uh, Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp. So thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm trying to be a little bit more lively with my voice. Let me know if it's working. So I'm, I'm speaking a little faster. I'm trying to get rid of like my ums and ahs. I, I still, I, I turn on the camera, I still cough. I, I, I That's got to be psychosomatic. I don't know how to edit, <laughs> and my computer just died. So uh, I, I use the computer to get thumbnails and stuff like that. So please forgive me. I, it's probably going to have bad thumbnails until I get my, co my computer fixed. So uh, it, it, it never ends. So thanks a lot. I, I hope you appreciate this. I hope you like this. And uh, I thanks a lot for uh, watching my videos. That, that, that means the world to me. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.